Hello, everyone. My name is Alan Dick, and on behalf of my fellow Commerce Next co-founders, Scott Silverman and Veronica Sonsev, I want to welcome you to today's webinar. Today is Wednesday, May 20th, 2020, and our topic this week is Did COVID-19 Kill AI Personalization? Before we start, I'd like to welcome our panelists. <clears throat> Darren Hall, he's a Chief Customer Officer at Vera Bradley. Eric Goes, VP of Marketing Strategy at Lane Bryant. Colby Sines, the Affiliate Manager at Purple and Cy Coppola, CMO at Sheer ID. Let's get started by taking a look at today's agenda. First off, we're gonna take a look at what upcoming events Commerce Next and our partners have. We're gonna take a look at some housekeeping notes in order to make certain you guys get the most out of this presentation. Then we're gonna have a couple of slides from us and from Sheer ID, uh, as well as Purple. We're gonna talk about a couple of data points there move on to some audience polls. And finally, the bulk of the conversation today will be a panel discussion and audience Q&A. So let's get started by taking a look at what's coming up next. Next week in Commerce Next, we have the accelerated evolution of customer journeys. Uh, this, that webinar is gonna look at the modern purchase journey and opportunities to create alignment between marketing and commerce teams for maximum performance. The webinar will feature research on changes to customer behavior followed by a panel that will discuss how they are adapting to these changes to stay relevant to their customers. Our friends over at the Global E-Commerce Leaders Forum also have a webinar tomorrow. They're gonna to be talking about crafting a cross-border strategy in today's environment. They believe that cross-border e-commerce during this time is a way for brands to expand their reach and drive demand for goods in less affected markets, particularly when domestic sales decline. You can register for that at the bit.ly URL below. But most importantly, we've got the Commerce Next Virtual Summit coming up on July 28th and 29th, 2020. Now, this is going to be based on a theme of path to recovery. We're going to have seven plus hours of content over two afternoons featuring uh, original merchant and consumer research. Our ex executive speakers are going to include Charlie Cole. He's the CEO of FTD. Joe Medjabo, the CEO of Purple. Sucharita Kudali, VP of Research at Forrester. And carry off the chief customer officer tailored brands that's going to be fantastic you definitely want to take a look at more details there you can go onto our website commercenext.com click on virtual summit all right let's go through some housekeeping notes first off don't worry about missing anything we're recording this webinar and we'll make it available either later today or tomorrow morning for you to review now let's take a moment to show you where things are on your screen if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you'll see three areas, Q&A, polls, and handouts. They're highlighted there. If you have got a question, and we strongly encourage you to ask questions of our panel, you can just type it into the Q&A box below. Uh, my partners, Veronica Sonsev and Scott Silverman, will be moderating those and kicking them up, and we'll make certain to ask our panel your questions. If you see somebody else's question and you really like it, hit the upvote button. That clues us in that that's an important one for us to look at. We also have handouts available. We've got the all the slides are available today as a download. You can see that in the handouts area. Sheer ID has a couple of uh, elements in there for you as well. Uh, so feel free to download those. And if you're listening to this on a recording, look at the document icon at the bottom of the recording to download all the documents I've just referenced. Now, on to the data. So here's um, an interesting, I want, to, so I want to start off by providing two data sets that really serve to underscore that COVID has really had a significant impact on AI personalization. This is from the MIT Technology Review from a couple of days ago. They noted that global consumer behavior changed extremely rapidly in just five days. Now, this chart shows the number of top 10 Amazon search terms related to the coronavirus, whether that's hand sanitizer, face masks, or soap, things like that. It went from almost nothing on the 20th of February to almost everything on the 25th of February, not just in the U.S., but around the world. It was rapid and massive. That was reflected in our own surveying of last week's uh, webinar attendee audience, 80% of the retailers surveyed on that uh, webinar said they had to adjust their personalization algorithms. Now, 18% highlighted in green said they didn't have any adjustments that were needed, but all of the rest either made significant adjustments, some adjustments, 
they needed to make them but didn't. That was about 7% or and about 14% shifted to a manual or rules-based model. So a lot of uncertainty and a lot of shifting going on when it comes to AI personalization. And with those two slides, I think we've kind of set up the topic. I want to turn this now over to Sai. So I want you to join us and uh, run through some of your discussion points about how to drive short-term revenue. Thank you, Alan. Um, this is Sai Coppola from Share ID. First of all, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share some of the best practices we are seeing of brands uh, navigating this pandemic. I've been fortunate enough to work with uh, leading brands like Nike, Spotify, and North Face on acquisition personalization strategies. So today I want to just uh, share a couple of uh, uh, examples on how one brands are adapting to this crisis and engaging customers. And second, the strategies they're using, personalization strategies they're using to drive short term revenue, but at the same time and, and looking for ways to, to enhance their brand or uh, keep the retain the brand value. So if you go to uh, let me start with an example, if you go to the next slide here. Uh, uh, let me start with an example of North Face. So North Face, which is part of the VF Corporation, uh, got in early in supporting with COVID relief efforts. They spent a million and a half uh, through a couple of nonprofits like a CDC emergency fund on helping the frontline workers and local communities. They also uh, um, gave another half a million in community grants. Now, this is something you know many brands have done through their corporate social responsibility initiatives. But North Face did something that many other brands have not done. What they wanted to do was they also wanted to show up and support the front lines in this pandemic. So they, apart from all the other activities, they also offered an unprecedented 50% off of all their merchandise just to medical workers. That is the nurses, nurses, first responders, doctors, and other medical workers. Now, uh, it has been a big success for them. But before we jump into that, let me take a step back and see what's happening uh, to give more context to it. So, as Alan was saying, you know, look, we're in unprecedented times. You know, the the biggest challenges uh, for brands and is how do you engage customers authentically in this environment? You know, it's very difficult to get an attention of the consumer. We all know we're all living it right now. You know, we are busy about thinking about staying safe, keeping our jobs, and in many cases, you know, homeschooling our children. So getting the consumer's attention is even more difficult. Second, there's been a big disruption in the channel. Physical stores are closed, they're slowly opening up. Having said that, there have been a couple of bankruptcies like Neiman Marcus and uh, JC Penney. And the long-term trends for mall-based physical stores is bleak. So we are definitely seeing more and more brands investing on direct-to-consumer e-commerce efforts. Having said that, the knee-jerk reaction these times is to do mass promotions. And a lot of the premium brands we work with are very hesitant to do that as they do not want to establish customer expectations that they won't be able to change once the crisis is over. And finally, uh, in a recent survey we did, 89% of the consumers want brands to support the healthcare workers and other affected populations. So just of it is what we are seeing the smart brands do is align their corporate social responsible initiatives with their acquisition campaigns in this time and age. So if we, to get a little bit deeper into this, if, um, if you look at overall data personalization, uh, we have been doing demographics based personalization for a long time. In the last five, 10 years, many of us have invested in uh, behavioral marketing where we invested in CDPs, customer data platforms, and custom audiences. And all of that is based on uh, buying patterns of the customer. Along with that, we're also seeing nowadays uh, a different form of personalization, which is based on the consumer's identity. 
how that consumer identifies themselves, what social tribe or consumer tribe they belong to. And that's the identity marketing we're seeing being used in conjunction with other uh, personalization techniques. Now, if you go back to uh, the North Face example, the offer was to medical workers. It's a sizable population. There are 16 million um, people work and who are medical workers, which includes 4 million nurses, 1.1 million doctors, and uh, two and a half million, close to two and a half million first responders. And they have disposable income. So if you look at uh, nurses, the average is 109,000 a year, doctors is 290,000, average medical workers is 70,000 roughly. And in these times where we are seeing unemployment rates go up, for example, I believe now for travel and hospitality, the unemployment rate is 35%. In this segment, this segment has not been as impacted. Um, employment rate still is at 90%. So it's a pretty uh, sizable segment with disposable income. And so what we're seeing more and more brands do is running a hero campaign where they are doing the right thing in supporting the frontline workers, but at the same time, they're driving short-term revenue, which creates a halo effect with the general population. Now, identity marketing is a broader topic. It is not just about this COVID crisis, right? There are other consumer tribes which have a hero status in our society, whether it's teachers, first responders, military, right? So we are seeing more and more brands figuring out how do I create mini Black Fridays throughout the year without compromising my brand value. The reason identity marketing works um, is a couple of reasons. Like one is these communities, whether it is uh, nurses or teachers, they are very tight knit communities. The word of mouth is big in this. So what happened, what we're seeing is when the offer is compelling, the offer goes viral within those communities. Second is one of the challenges in an online world is consumers can do a Google search. And nowadays you have things like honey where they can easily find discount codes. The challenge for marketers is, how do I create a compelling offer just for a targeted audience? And uh, through identity marketing, one of the key pillars of that is you can instantly verify eligibility for that offer in the buying process on your site or in the app. So those are the reasons why we're seeing a significant um, uh, increase in using this technique in uh, acquiring and engaging customers. We worked with uh, 200 plus brands over the last few years. And out of that, uh, looking at all the best practices, we created a simple playbook. What we are seeing is the brand first identifies what is the consumer tribe that is most relevant to them that aligns with their core audience. So for example, if uh, you know your audience is women between the ages of 30, 45, then uh, they are looking at segments like nurses, teachers, military spouses. And that enables you to then give compelling exclusive offers around Nurses Appreciation Day or Veterans Day or Teacher Appreciation Day, right? The second piece of it, once you identify the tribe, the question is, okay, what is the offer you want to uh, deliver to this particular audience to, uh, um, and the, it doesn't have to be just discounts. What we have seen is it can be an exclusive access, early access, right? It could be an add-on, uh, or it could be an exclusive product just for that segment. Once you've defined the offer, what we have then seen is then you want to push this offer out through all your channels. One of the fallacies out there is, hey, this audience exists in one particular location. The reality is, for example, if you take military, there are 37 million people in the United States in the community, if you include active duty, veterans, retirees, National Guard, and military spouses, they are everywhere where other consumers are. Same thing with teachers. So the best strategy we've seen work is that the offer is really compelling. You actually want to push it through your organic channels, web uh, and mobile. And the beauty of this is you want the offer to go viral because there's a backstop on your site or your app, which ensures only that audience takes advantage of this offer. That's the step, step four of the verification piece of it. And the last piece 
of it is this is where we are seeing increasingly um, becoming data exchange becoming important. As we adopt GDPR and uh, California Online Privacy Acts, in this method, what's happening is there's an explicit exchange of value between the consumer and the brand. The consumer is explicitly giving the brand information about themselves, whether it's date of birth, their professional status, the profession, in exchange for the offer. That enables the brand to then uh, engage in a much richer fashion going forward with the consumer. Talking about that, let me give you one example here one, uh, before I pass it back to Alan. Lowe's uh, in the home improvement business, after contractors, the next best segment is do-it-yourselfers. They tend to be male in the age groups 30, 40s and resourceful that aligns well with the military segment. So Lowe's, given its history, which has been supporting the military community for a long time, they align their brand with that community. So what happens now is when you join their loyalty program, when you sign up for my Lowe's, one of the questions they ask is, are you part of the military? And they verify that instantly. And now that's associated with your status as a con uh, with the, within their program. So one, whenever you go to the low store, you get automatic 10% off, but it also gives the brand ability now to engage just with that community. So they do a monthly email just to the community with special offers to get them back into the store or to you know, purchase. And that they have seen increase has done about a two to three X engagement better than the next best program. So in general, what we are seeing in these times is brands looking at different ways they can personalize yes of course we can personalize based on prior purchasing behavior but they're also looking at how can we personalize based on how people identify themselves and in the context of the current crisis we are seeing more and more brands offering uh, special offers to the medical workers because one it drives short-term revenue two it creates a halo effect for the brand uh, within the general population and enhances the brand. With that, let me pass it back to Alan. So what we're going to do is we're going to have a series of four questions we want to ask everyone in the audience. Uh, you'll see those on the upper right-hand part of your screen. Uh, when we're done with them, click on closed, and that'll tell you what all the results were from them. If you're listening to this on a pre-recorded uh, webinar, uh, just go down to the document icon there, and then you can get all the documentation, including all the poll results there. All right, time to start polling. First question, overall, how would you rate your company's ability to meet the new and evolving needs of your customers? Would that be excellent, very good, average, below average, or poor? All right, looks like 60% of you chose very good, nine were excellent. Good, that's good to see. All right, and let's close that one. The next one, which personalization areas below are you spending the most time on? Now you can click that all that apply. It's email, product recommendations, retargeting, location-based offers, homepage navigation and personalization. It right, definitely looks like email is in the lead with 34%, product recommendations coming in second at 23, well done. Next one, the size point. Is your brand currently offering targeted promotions to medical workers or other hero segments? And you can see four answers there. Yes, no, we're thinking about it, or it's just not applicable. Let's see where everyone's at. 30, let's see what we got going on here, more coming in. Yeah, so roughly a third of you are, a third of you are not. And about 25% say it's not applicable. Interesting. All right, cool. Thank you for all that. Appreciate it. Colby, I'm going to come back to you. I'm going to move, that, move the slides back. Awesome. Well, thanks to, thank you, Sai and Al, for having me on. So just to hit on just some of the um, personalization strategies that we have had here at Purple. So um, our plan for 2020 was to expand our current breadth of programs um, within ShareID. Um, we have been with Share ID since spring of 2019, and to be honest, we, we've had a lot of success with the program since we have launched with them. 
Um, and as I mentioned, 2020 was to expand the breadth of the programs with Q2, Q3 kind of being the main drivers of the biz- of us expanding those programs. But obviously with what happened with COVID-19, we really expedited a lot of the programs that we had. Um, since last year, we've only been running military discount as well as our first responders discount. Um, those two being the primary ones that we've actually just built around um, and then in 2020, the plan was to launch um, students and teachers, healthcare professionals. Um, those those were the main ones that we wanted to be able to really grow around. Um, healthcare professionals, we moved to the forefront at the end of March. Um, that was obviously to be able to give the healthcare workers who are helping us during this pandemic a quality offer similar to what we have with um, the military discount. Um, and then students and teachers, we wanted to be able to launch in time for Teacher Appreciation Week, which was the week of Mother's Day this year. Um, and both of those were programs that got turned around very, very quickly between our side on at Purple as well as with Share ID. Um, I, I'm, and I'm, when I'm saying quickly, I'm talking, we, we turned those programs around within four or five weeks. Um, spread out for all of them. And then the additional program that was not in the plan that we decided to add was for truck drivers. Um, Purple has a um, unique offering in seat cushions um, on top of um, some of the other products that we offer, such as pillows and obviously mattresses. Um, we wanted to be able to offer truck drivers a unique offer as well, since I know for our business, um, getting our product to customers is really relying on the truck the um, transportation companies that we partner with. Um, so what we did with Share ID is we found a list of the top 100 transportation companies, um, and Share ID fortunately was able to customize a program for us that um, allows us to verify their employment. And we're actually set to be able to launch that program within the next week, so that way we can offer truck drivers um, the actual verification and personalization program through um, through our website through their program. Um, and obviously with the offer. Um, To size point, we wanted to make sure that the offer is consistent across the board. Um, We offer 10% off to all of these individual programs. Um, Obviously, they have to get verified through Share ID for them to be able to qualify for the offer, but to be able to have that um, synonymous amongst all channels or all offers um, makes it to where it is. It's, It's easy for us to be able to keep track. I know we tested in the past. Um, 10% was the dollar amount that obviously valued us from margins, um, from a margin standpoint, as well as um, really got customers willing to go. And then last, I think just to kind of hit on what our programs have done since we've launched, um, since in the in the um, eight weeks that we have actually launched um, all of these individual programs. So again, for military, first responders, healthcare professionals, students and teachers, um, we've seen um, that those programs have actually produced 58% of last year's revenue in just the past eight weeks. Um, It's been pretty incredible just to see how many people have been going to that. I know military discount is our our best, but healthcare professionals has seen such a dramatic increase um, over the past few weeks um, since we have turned that on. And, And I think that's just a testament to being able to pay attention to what's going on, not only in the market, but also being able to hear the feedback that customer service is getting as far as to who they feel should be able to have a discount. All right, Colby, did you have any more to offer there or did you cut out? Oh, I I, I don't know if I cut out or not, but no, I think for us, I think working with Share ID has been phenomenal. I think the biggest thing that we have recognized is that um, these these make a big difference. And I think being able to have quality support to be able to help not only launch these programs, but also being able to incorporate um, demographics or customer bases that we feel that your product feels like hits on some of the key points uh, or the key audiences that make a difference for your business, I, I think really helps. And that's what partnering with a company like ShareID makes a big difference in being able to help those programs go live and making sure that customers are happy and being able to take advantage of um, the products and the services that you have to offer. All right. Thank you very much, Kobe. Really appreciate it. All right. I'm going to ask all of the speakers to turn on their cameras. Darren and Eric, we got you on board. Colby's up. 
I just all right. So, all right. Well, while Sai is coming on, I'd like to welcome uh, uh, two other panelists, Eric Goes and Darren Hall. Darren, let uh, let me get your initial thoughts on this. You're the chief customer officer at Beer Bradley. What do you think so far? I think uh, if I take away some key things, one is um, maybe shift us into the discussion, which is AI and personalization are going to be really important uh, in the days to come. So as all of us uh, on this call are trying to rescale our business uh, through a tremendous amount of uncertainty, uh, we don't know what next week is going to look like. You know, we're living a little bit day by day. So I think AI is going to help us with that quick changes of our customer experience or finding new pathways to brand engagement that fit along with our changing customer preferences. So um, I think that AI, at least for our business, has been critical in managing everything from inventory planning and allocation across geographies that have been severely affected in very, very different ways um, to how we're calculating pricing or discounting to try to preserve margin in areas that haven't been as hard hit by uh, the pandemic. Um, and organizations are now in that mode of questioning everything um, you know that used to be normal. So it's not about comping what is last year. It's about using that current set of data along with historical data to come up with new ways to adapt uh, our businesses to a rapidly changing landscape. Um, you know, we've done uh, healthcare worker outreaches and and did that in the past, but certainly much more intense in recent days. And I think that ability to adapt will be a key contributor to all of our our retail success. All right, great. Let me bring in Eric Goes. He's the VP of Marketing Strategy at Lane Bryant. Eric, what uh, what did you take away from the beginning of this uh, webinar? Well, I think to kind of riff off of what uh, what Darren mentioned there is, is the um, right the the AI machine learning that that we've all come to know and love over the last few years um, has had to have a lot of human intervention recently, right? Colby mentioned that's uh, right four or five weeks of of getting those campaigns up that didn't happen automatically, right? That that was a lot of people who were uh, who were doing a lot of you know hands on work. Um, to, to get those up and running. And we're seeing the similar thing with how we're leveraging the data set. So it's not just the access to them, but right, it's the human interpretation, understanding and application of them um, that uh, uh, you don't have the longevity of that data to uh, um, to be able to create any modeling off of. So mm -hmm. um, some of that human human interpretation and, and how our teams are, are applying that um, day in and day out, I think is a, a really, Interesting and um, uh, you know I'll say kind of a, an amazing outcome um, that uh, uh, that that should come out from this is uh, um, you know how our teams are leveraging that data um, just to be smarter because they're reacting so much more in real time right now. Yep, Colby, I'm going to turn over to you here. So let's talk a little bit more about how AI plays a role in your company. It's, you, can you give us more of a, an overview on that, or do you think you kind of pretty much covered it in your talk? Um, I, I think I can, I think I pretty much covered just the basis of it. I think for us, the biggest thing that we're experiencing is um, we are adapting our web platform so that way we can be able to make some adjustments and have a lot of the customization that we've been looking to have. Um, I think a lot of the big personalization points for us have been in what we can control. Um, and, you know, obviously, as you are expanding as a company, because Purple is pretty much a very young company, I, I think the biggest thing that we're trying to do is really hit on the key areas. Um, like email, like what we're able to do in affiliates and programs like Share ID. Um, the site personalization is something that we are planning on being able to get up to speed. But to be honest, it takes it, it's taking time, and as I'm sure as anybody can attest to, uh, uh, changes in your website don't always go as according to plan. Yeah. Oh, I'm familiar completely with things not going according to plan. I'm I'm kind of witnessing that right now. So, yeah, <laughs> definitely definitely understand that. <laughs> Thank you, Sai, for that. All right, Darren, any thoughts on that? Do you want to talk a little bit more about how AI plays a role in your company? Yeah, I think if I were to walk through, I'll I'll even keep in a little bit with how the survey uh, was laid out there. I think, it, it, I guess for anybody who's in the audience, we uh, as an organization, I guess in the two years that I've been there, we've, we've at Vera Bradley, we've gotten much tighter on how we want to embrace AI within the organization. So I would say for this group during the pandemic, where we've really leaned into AI 
I think firstly, driving programmatic ad sales. I think as inventory and social media has taken on greater importance with everybody at home and not seeing other people, um, there's a lot of efficiency to be gained in uh, driving pro programmatic ad buys with lookalike models, um, improve site personalization and experience. Uh, email person personalization has been a real strong one for us um, using subject uh, line testing, uh, content manipulation, uh, et cetera. Um, chat box for customer service, I think for all of us that also have a significant store fleet. Um, so I'm responsible for a number of stores and there you have a, a, an associate that's able to give people the customer service that they want. Um, now with most of the sales being online, you have a lot of cancellations and delayed shipments because you're trying to do social distancing in the warehouse. Um, that's really increased the number of calls that come into the center and chat bots have been really good at, at taking off that initial wave of, you know, where's my order and things like that. Um, term prediction and, and smart customer engagement. So um, we've done a lot of random forest analyses to, to look for certain variables that, that uh, give us confidence in sort of heading off some of the customer churn and, and devising ways to address that before it happens um, and customer insight triggers. So I'd kind of ask people to look at, you know, particularly for new customers, does your welcome wave uh, is it still presenting the brand you, the way you want it to uh, during the pandemic? So, um, you know, we use AI in a bunch of different ways, almost always wrapped around two principles, which is um, how do we give the best customer service to our loyal customers? So drive things like uh, customer satisfaction and NPS scores. Um, and how do we best manage new customer acquisition and retention? So those are really our two areas we're focused in using AI in. Outstanding. Eric, you want to kick in on that? Yeah. So uh, for us, in, in my areas in particular, um, it's really around audience creation and then the modeling that you can do off of that for from a paid media perspective. So, um, you know, we've leaned in heavy on uh, um, email, um, SMS and uh, uh, direct mail, um, a little less direct mail in the uh, in the current environment right now. Um, but uh, um, uh, the, the email and SMS uh, um, uh, personalization and trying to find you know, either large segments or micro segments of audiences has been, uh, um, you know, a, uh, a focus for us, as well as, as Darren mentioned, the, the paid media side. There, there is a ton of efficiency to be gained out there right now. Um, and if you can find the, the right audience uh, uh, with the right message, there are a lot more eyeballs uh, um, uh, um, uh, sitting, you know, at desks, uh, um, at kitchen tables right now with uh, uh, a, a Zoom uh, uh, window open and a, a Facebook or Instagram uh, window open, a tablet next to them, a phone next to them. So the ability to reach customers um, uh, who are open to receiving um, a brand right as well as a, a, the message of meeting her where she's at right now. Um, you know, understanding that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the the type of purchases that she's making. If you can get that, um, not necessarily perfect, but pretty right, um, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful. All right. I want to start going to some of the audience questions. So we're starting to see them come in. Scott Krause has asked, uh, for the 80% of retailers that needed to adjust their personalization algorithms, what percentage of the respondents have in-house data science uh, resources. Well, Scott, um, I'm not exactly certain. Um, maybe I'll have Scott and Veronica come in and kick in on that one, but I'll kind of reframe that for um, uh, Colby, Eric, and Darren. Do you guys have any, like, what do your uh, in-house data science resources look like? Colby, I'll start with you. Yeah, so so we have a, so we have a full, um, well, our, our analytics team has been expanding out over the past, I would say, eight, nine months as far as to us being able to have um, data science and a lot of our analytics being a lot more funneled through. Uh, I think for us, it, it, the, this year the, this year has been hard just because with COVID hitting, we had to evaluate and make sure that we had our resources put in the right places. So for us, um, we, we made some adjustments in how we did it, but 
I think the hardest part for us is that um, since we are still growing, we haven't put as much time into that as we probably as probably some of the other guys have. I, I think what we, we see the value in it, and I think that's going to be the plan for 2020. But I, I think with the changes that happen, it really just comes down to um, paying attention to what your customer service team has been saying and the feedback that they've been getting. I know that between our e-commerce, our acquisitions, and um, and our customer service team, we, we have very, very detailed meetings meetings um, throughout the week to be able to understand what changes and adjustments we need to make since that for us is pretty much the main way that we make the adjustments for us. Um, the data wise, I think for us, we, we, we are making adjustments and we are looking at things, but it's, it's kind of not, it's not anywhere as in depth as some of the other guys on the call have it so far. Hey, Sai, let me kick this over to you. Out of your client base, uh, and I know you don't have the exact answer in front of you, but I'm kind of curious, based on just anecdotal information, what uh, what percentage of your clients do you think have in-house data science resources? So it totally depends on the size of the companies, right? So what, I, what we find is some of the larger organizations, like, you know, let me pick an example, a Nike or a Target, a lot of in-house personalization, right? Whereas we go around to the smaller companies, more and more, uh, they are looking at external solutions for personalizing these third parties. Okay. Darren, Eric, what are your thoughts? How do you guys deal with the data science resources? Yeah, I think we we have uh, data scientists and um, over the last year, I've more than doubled uh, my business uh members of the business analysis team um i think where we've tried to make a bigger step is understanding that the data is kind of for all the people in the organization for decision support and finding ways to democratize that data down to key members in each department so within your merchant teams and customer service teams making sure and you know really all your teams making sure there's at least one individual that has access to tools like Power BI or Tableau, uh, reports that are being created out of the data, data science team um, to make sure that people, people are finding their own paths and being creative and making sure that they can propose solutions as well. Eric, any yeah, thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, in-house in team uh, um, uh, for us, um, and, and then I think uh, particularly in the, in the time we're in right now, it's you know the the macroization of it. It's expanding it out to your partners as well too, right? So um, uh, ensuring that your activation platforms um, are at least informed or aware, and sometimes there's where that human interaction comes in um, to uh, uh, to the, to bring that data to life across those platforms. So. Uh, uh, in-house uh, um, a data science team uh, combined with uh, um, in-house analytics team and then your you know your kind of uh, uh, channel leaders who are interpreting and applying that data often on platforms that might live outside of uh, of your of your company so ensuring that you've got your partners uh, um, in, in lockstep whether that's agency or platform partners that uh, that can benefit from that data all right I think, I think a big point is do you think more of this is going to happen over time or less of this is going to happen over time? And if you believe more, like I would assume pretty much everybody on this call, you should be focused on how you uh, push resources and push strength into that organization and make it better and better every year. Well, that was one of the questions I wanted to ask you guys uh, a little bit later on, but I think let's hit it now. I mean, given everything that's gone on, do you think it's gonna be easier to make the case for more resources or do you think it's gonna be harder? I mean, I, I know what I think, but you, you guys are in the front lines there. Darren, since you teed that up, I'll kick it back to you. Yeah, I mean, I hope I hope that it's easier, right? Uh, I I would have hoped that we're past uh, that point in retail where we continue to have to have this discussion. I think leadership and and you know, I'm a director at a public company, right? Like you have certain people get nervous when they hear about things like neural neural networks, right? Because they haven't historically grown up around that or use that inside of orgs that are typically merchandising or financially focused. Um, but if you really put it simply, if you think back in time, right, the modern retailer throws off uh, so much more data than, than, than it did, you know, two, three decades ago when lots of us started. So I think AI, if you put it simply, it's just here to help us deal with that breadth and depth of data to help us process it, to help us find patterns in it um, and to work with it and more importantly, to action it. So I think that business 
that business analytics resource is going to become a key member of all these departments. It's not going to be this centralized organization, but it's going to be kind of built inside of the organization to really make things uh, stronger. And I think when you have a pandemic like this, um, for those of us who have seen tough times in retail and, and, and for those who have joined retail in the last 10 years, you haven't really felt a tough time in retail, but yeah. those of us who went through it in 08 and 01 and, um, you know, earlier times than that, right? You, you know that tough times are tough and retail will focus in the short term on simplification um, and firms are really quicker to cut than they are to add jobs, right? So we're gonna be in this um, time where you're focused on weekly trends instead of monthly trends or historical data. Um, there's gonna be a lot of human intervention and work just like you have over the last weeks and months, right? A lot of common sense has to come to bear when you're reworking promos or creative or things like that. So all of this processing of data, all of this dealing with disparate sets of stores being opened and closed, that all plays into the strengths of AI and, and personalization. Um, and I hope that in the silver lining on all of this is people can, can, you know, people on this call even can be the problem solver who brings forward these solutions that maybe had limited traction ahead of the pandemic, um, but can be one of the solutions that help you get out of a really large problem that we're all in. So hopefully, uh, companies will make more progress against this um, while we all go through these tough times. Yep, Eric. Yeah, I think you know I'm gonna I'm gonna harken back to that comment on the uh, democratization of, of the data and really where you are not only investing potentially in in headcount that might be dedicated resources, but ensuring that all of your teams one have access and stars are going to emerge, right? I mean, people are going to, I, I remember the first time I got an Omniture or actually it was a core metrics login years ago and it felt like the entire world had opened up to me. And, um, you know, we're seeing that right now. I'm so incredibly proud of our teams um, that have dug into the platforms, um, uh, whether it's first party data or leveraging from our data sciences team and then creating that quick application, right? That human intervention that, uh, um, well, let me see. Okay, let me join this piece with this piece. Yep. And, you know, common sense tells me that those two things might go together. Let me try this experiment. And that more bottoms up approach, we're seeing that right now with our teams. Um, and um, it, it's it, it's incredibly energizing in a time that, to, uh, you know, the news isn't always great. Um, it's really energizing to see um, the spark um, that, you know, smart people will, will find solutions to, to things um, given the given the tools and a little bit of training. Colby and Sai, I'm assuming you guys feel pretty much the same. Way. On what Go ahead, Sai. I'm sorry, what was that? Building on what Eric and uh, Darren were saying, right? What we are seeing is um, there's a slight shift where the centralized teams are still very much focused on the quality of data and centralizing data is having a common view of the customer, um, which is still a bear in many cases because you got data silos everywhere. But then uh, there are enough tools out there right now that the analysis and taking insights is is going to the businesses. Um, so. There, that's centralized some pieces of this puzzle. So you have a single view of the customer, but the analysis and the insights are very much on the business dependent, though those analysts would actually sit in your uh, business teams. Kobe, any last thoughts on that question about, about the uh, ability to get resources for this, to get to improve AI? I mean, yeah, so I think we're pretty committed to it. I mean, to, to me, the question really isn't anymore, did COVID-19 kill AI personalization? It's a kind of wounded it and altered it, and it's probably going to wind up making it better over time. But, you know, yeah, your thoughts, yeah. sir? So, yeah, so I think for us, it, it's it's kind of in alignment with what Darren was saying. I think what this what this time has shown us is that the importance of personalization is honestly a lot higher than it was before. Um, I think the biggest thing that we're seeing is that 
um, when you can target somebody based off of their actual history and what they've been doing, uh, I mean, understanding that information is valuable, but you have to be able to translate it. I know for, from an email standpoint, how can we customize our emails to be able to be more targeted based off of somebody's engagement on a previous email, um, since that is obviously a big driver for us. I know our leadership really values um, the components of being able to be more targeted and have more personalization incorporated, and I think that's that's definitely going to be a, a consistent driver and initiative for us as we look ahead because we, since we are such a young company, we haven't even scratched the surface on what's possible. Um, and I think the performance that we have had during this point in time um, has been really a, an indicator for us of what we could be doing to be able to make the relationship between us and our customers a lot more intimate than it was, than it has been beforehand. Um, so I, I think when it comes down to programs like what Sheer ID does and some of the other key components between what we do with the email and some of our ad targeting, our paid media, um, ideally the biggest thing that we have seen and we have are honestly started doing um, over the past uh, month or two has really been honing in more on a custom um, custom approaches to the the air tar the customers and the personas that we know um, resonate best with us have performed the best and really trying to speak more and understand more about what's behind that to be able to drive the business going forward. Cool. Well, I got you, Colby. Um, Sejal Solanke uh, has asked, what percentage of your online revenue is attributed to programs through Sheer ID? If you can answer it specifically or generally, I don't want to put you on the spot, but yeah. it's a, a question and want to answer it. No, no, to be honest, it, it fluctuates, but we are definitely between the um, between 10 to 15 percent of our business uh, um, that we've seen online has been from Share ID programs. Cool. One of the one of the interesting things that came up during the um, speaker prep call, and I definitely want to get to, is I want to talk to you guys about how you've been incorporating any COVID-related data, uh, you know, to inform your decision or improve your results. Eric, do you want to take a stab at that first? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, we, we've used a, a couple of different data sources. One is some of the publicly available uh, um, uh, case data, right, by uh, uh, by geography, as well as some of the economic data. So unemployment data that might be coming in as well, too, and use this directionally, right? It's not the only piece of information um, that we're coming in because you've got a, a ton of, uh, um, uh, you know, very specific local or statewide um, uh, pieces that might govern uh, um, some of the some of the elements of, of what's going on of that state but we've leveraged that for audience selection on um, uh, the direct mail side of things so we've got some direct mail later in the year and said you know areas uh, um, like uh, the tri-state area um, uh, you know new york new jersey um, uh, uh, philadelphia area that uh, um, uh, might be um, stores might not be open at the same pace as they will in the balance of the country. Um, so how are we going to go about that with our audience selection um, from, a, a, from a direct mail perspective, um, as well as informing potentially um, store openings as well, too. So leveraging that data. So we've got uh, uh, folks in our store operations team who are looking at that and, and trying to make as informed decisions as possible with data that updates very, very frequently. Um, and, uh, and again, uh, back to what Darren said, uh, just applying that, that common sense um, um, to it as well too so here's you know if, if there's anything anybody takes away is that yes ai data but the the human application of that has been so important over the last 10 weeks great darren anything to add to that yeah i was just gonna say like stating the obvious uh you know when your most retail algorithms want whatever two years of data to be accurate um and and the march in itself gave a lot of algorithmic uncertainty right so uh, once you get off the rails, you start looking for what, uh, whatever else you can throw in there. So we've gone to a lot of public data sources, uh, a lot of websites, and, and actually brought to meetings. I always call them, uh, at our place, I call them Apollo 13 meetings. So like that scene in the movie where everybody dumps stuff out on the table and you figure out how to get the team back to Earth. We, we throw things out on the table and we figure out what we can do to kind of make a positive change in the organization. So we've done a lot of unemployment data, which tends to be lagged by about two weeks and is obviously, un, or I guess should say, unfortunately very strong right now. Um, but that has helped us with, you know, there's some real obvious ones, the heavier the COVID penetration, the stronger our online sales are. So we've kind of taken the inverse of some of that stuff as we reopen stores, uh, especially going into Memorial Day weekend, how we do uh, phone call outreach, um, how we reach out to most loyal customer from our stores as we reopen up, 
um, to gauge also gauges of customer um, customer sentiment and 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 uh, their enthusiasm to get back out and shop. So any any once you get out of your historical data sets, you put everything back on the table. <laughs> I saw you nodding, Sai. Anything to say to that, or just oh yeah, I hear you. <laughs> No, like, look, what Dan says is right, right? Like, a lot of this algorithm, it's like a black box. They rely on a lot of uh, data to come up with trends. If I actually, you know, put that aside for a second and look at other opportunities, there are some uh, gems to be found here, new strategies and new channels to pursue to see what can stick for beyond COVID, right? So. All right. Uh, so, so I'm going to stick with you for a second. Uh, Taylor Byers is asked, do you feel that the changes made during the pandemic to personalization will remain long term or will retailers need to adjust again in the coming months and year uh, from your kind of macro perch? What's the what's the first thought on that? You're talking to me? Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Look, the personalization, so what has happened, if you think about it, in the last few years, a lot of personalization has been based on data. And a lot of the data is actually buying behavior. Uh, but personalization is beyond that, right? So end of the day, the consumer, you need to create that emotional connection. And therefore, to create the emotional connection, you need to more about that person, especially if the person has not purchased anything from you. So what we are finding brands look at is, okay, great. We, we have this uh, tool in our toolkit to personalize based on data we have about them which is more, mostly on shopping behavior, but how do I get more information about this person? What do, what, what is the, what tribe they belong to? And the, adding that is relevant beyond COVID days. Yep. Yep. Oh, Aaron? I was going to throw out something that's like, we just touched on it, but for people to have something to take away from this, we all talk about things that we're doing at our companies that are successful, but like, there's a big difference between um, saying, right, you need to figure out how to use a combination of historical and current behavioral data to feed your model, or you need a machine learning framework that like continuously retrain the model against the environmental changes. But like, what do people on this call walk away from this and do? And I would say one, increase the frequency at, at which you look at data. You know, we talked about it, look at everything that's around you and see if you can find um, some other data sources that are meaningful in the now. Um, two, lower your significance value. So, um, you know, think about how things change day to day now. It's great to have 95% significance, but it takes forever to get there when, you know, your traffic is really inconsistent or you're having only a few stores in your fleet open. If you drop that to 85 or frankly even 75, you can make some good directional decisions. Um, and three, like if I were to rattle off a third one, it would be figure out what you're actually testing for. So when you set up tests and you're gonna go out and try to do something, just write down the one or two questions you're really trying to answer. And as soon as you feel sort of okay about it, put something in action and get it into the field. Don't sit back um, and worry about the uncertainty in your data sets because honestly, it may be years before we feel like we can pull March and uh, April out of our, our data set. So, um, you know, it hasn't, to the title of this, COVID hasn't killed it, but it's made it more difficult. It's time to kind of loosen up the reins and move more quickly. Yeah, and that's a great segue because I wanted to get, <clears throat> excuse me, I wanted to have the last question kind of be all the panelists' thoughts on, you know, what would you say to someone wanting to review or revamp? What would be, you know, their AI personalization programming? What would you say to them? What, what are the, the key takeaways someone can take away from this? Eric, I'm going to kick it over to you and then over to Colby and then let's I have the last word. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the first thing I think is that uh, evaluate your tool set. You have a bunch of stuff today that can work, right? Um, budgets are going to be probably a little constrained in the in the coming months. So, um, you know, new part bringing on new partners might be a little more difficult. So, you have a bunch of stuff. Reach out to those partners. Um, number two, share those business challenges with those partners and in your internal teams, and try to be pretty focused on them. Um, uh, to Darren's point, what are the one or two questions, not the sixteen? The itch to scratch question. It doesn't matter right now. Um, so, you know, uh, try, try to uh, kind of move away from that. 
Um, and, and finally, um, you know, ensuring your teams have the autonomy to drive uh, against those business challenges that you've laid out as well too. And a little bit of the capacity to fail um, because you know we've got to have a little grace during this time frame, but things aren't going to be perfect, right? Um, you know, for, for me, I, I've always subscribed to the uh, progress over perfection. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of the uh, uh, the moment that we're in right now. I do want to add to, to Darren's point, I'll give you a four and a five on that. The um, For those of you who are multi-channel retailers, um, the ability to look at um, uh, new online customers who are not, now multi-channel, they're gonna have a very different value than the previous multi-channel customers, right? Um, so there's some of this forced behavior. So looking at that and looking at the attributes that are gonna be really different for them, and then the new customers that you were able to acquire during this time frame, how similar or different do they look than than uh, um, previously acquired new customers? Um, because there might be some gems of uh, um, of data attribution in there that you can go back to and say, "All right, now let me let me model against these and, and prospect a little differently going forward." Sounds good, Colby. Yeah, so I would say the biggest thing that we've um, to to hit on is um, silos are are going to cause problems down the line. And I think when it comes down to these initiatives, I know whether the team that's going with it, whether it's your analytics or your data team, how, whoever it is, they oftentimes have the tendency to be able to go at it and kind of ask for input um, at later down in the process where uh, I feel like the biggest thing to consider is that you always want to be able to start right off the bat and get an idea as far as to what everybody's individual needs are, what initiatives that they have, because oftentimes you will see some overlap or you will see some um, some uh, additional channels needing some insight or seeing value value and what you're offering. And the main thing you need to do is you need to make sure you're communicating. Um, I would rather, for, for at least for me, from working with my data team, the biggest thing is we would always like input at the beginning so that way we can decide if it makes sense for us to move forward or not. Um, and it, at that point, it's our fault if we do not communicate what our needs are. So I think as you're looking to be able to get something going, always look, connect with your partners, find out what your individual um, teams would need as far as to support from your side. And then at that point, be able to communicate very clearly concisely what what opportunities could exist if you could be able to get some of those initiatives um, move forward and um, have everybody be able to get the data that they're looking for. Sai, the last word is yours. <clears throat> sure. um, taking the long view here, I think in the last few years, we've gotten used to just behavioral data and personalizing based on behavioral data, which is great. But to create that emotional connection, you need more than that. And what we are finding is when you include identity marketing, where you're able to get an explicit exchange of information from the customer, the customer calls it uh, zero party data, or first calls zero party data or self-attested data. When you get more information about them, about who they by themselves, we are seeing uh, conversions go up much higher. So think about tools when in the long run, think about tools beyond just behavioral data and look at also uh, identity attributes when you think yep. of personalization. All right, that's going to do it for us. Guys, thank you so much. Eric Goes, Colby Signs, Darren Hall, Cy Kovala. Thank you guys so much for joining us today. Really appreciate you being here. Just a quick reminder, next week on Commerce Next, we've got the Accelerated Evolution of Customer Journeys. Our friends over at Global E-Commerce Leaders Forum have their uh, crafting a cross-border strategy in today's environment a webinar for you tomorrow. Might want to check that one out. And finally, head over to commercenext.com to check out our, all the information about the Commerce Next Virtual Summit taking place over two days on July 28th and 29th. We also have a full deck of uh, information on our Digital Retail Resource Center over at commercenext.com COVID, constantly updated with all of our webinars and other information, including uh, research. Thanks our panelists again. And finally, I want to thank our sponsor, Sheer ID. Uh, their first campaign is on them. It's their way to help support uh, the heroes that are out there taking care of us and they'll help you get to them. So if you're interested in that, they've got a couple of handouts for you. We also have our handouts available as well. And with that, finally, the big thank you to everyone that has attended our webinar today. Thank you very much. Have a good week and we'll see you next week. Thanks everybody. Thank Bye -bye. you.